So as I was going over at the last meeting, problem set one is the mechanics review problem set. And um, and it's extra credit. You do have to score at least one point to move on to the remainder of the module. Um, and But, you know, it's extra credit. I do want you to spend some time reviewing the things you learned in Physics 4A. Um, but I don't want you to spend too much time because it, this is class isn't about Physics 4A. It's about Physics 4B. So uh, last meeting, I pulled out these questions, but I didn't have... Um, time to go over most of them. So I think uh, um, I'll do that now. Uh, so uh, the first question I went over that last time, so don't need to do that. This question I went over the part that I wanted to, so that's it, I don't have, we don't have to do anymore. So I'll, and I'll go over the rest of the questions. Uh, so there's one, two, three. Uh, oh, and I added one question. Someone was asking me some questions about this and I think a part D is the part where it takes more a number of steps, and uh, this is the kind of the problem-solving skill that we are trying to teach in um, all the calculus-based general physics classes. And it takes time and practice to build up that uh, problem-solving muscle. So uh, I want so I want you to go over this. Um, I think I'll have time. Yeah. So. So that's, uh, the, those are the questions that I thought I should go over. I'm also happy to take requests. Um, if uh, people tried any particular question in the problem set and were struggling, well, I, yeah. So, um, yeah, well, so let me go over the questions. Uh, yeah. In future problem, well, in future problem sets, I can do a, a uh, little bit of a more thorough job of trying to figure out where people are struggling. Um, and, but you know, this one is just a review and it's extra credit. So I think if you are struggling with any particular question that you didn't ask me about, and I happen not to go over it here, I think that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so let me uh, start out with, the, this question. So even though this is not the question that I thought it was, I think it's still worth going through. And uh, really the reason for it is it's a, it involves a centripetal acceleration. And of the many different things you learned in Physics 4A, one thing that we will use in Physics 4B is a centripetal acceleration. Um, we probably won't use any of the whole projectile motion thing, like there are no projectiles in that occur naturally in physics 4B. So we don't want really use the projectile motion thing. But one thing that will come up is a centripetal acceleration when we do magnetism. So, um, so I think this question is worth going through. So let me do that. So, um, so this is... Um, so let me just uh, <laughs> read the question and draw figures uh, as I'm reading the question. That's uh, kind of my process for uh, making sure I understood all the information in the question and that I didn't miss anything. So it says uh, 30 gram ball at the end of a string. So I'm drawing a string and a ball at the end. And it says it's being swung in a vertical circle with a radius of some radius r. So this is the trajectory of this ball. Oops, uh, let me finish drawing it and move it down. Um, the tangential velocity is v, find the tension in the string um, at two different positions. So I drew one already at the bottom of the circle. So this is gonna be v. And I guess I have to consider when this is at the top of the circle. So, no, that's the center. Uh, let me draw the radius. That's the radius. And um, it says find the tension in the string. So what is the tension T along the string? So as you read it and stare at the questions, this is the first thing you have to realize as you are considering this question that this is a 
Newton's law problem. And this is my biggest hint that this question involves Newton's law. It's that it's asking for tension, which is a force. So <laughs> I'm looking for a force. So I should use a problem solving strategy that involves forces. And that's Newton's law, uh, problem solving strategy. Uh, there are sometimes other, um, other hints you can look for. If a question somehow involves a finding acceleration, there's a chance that it also has to involve net force. So here I see that it's asking for tension, which is a force. So I have to use Newton's law, problem solving strategy to find the tension. So this is a quick review of Newton's law problem solving strategy. Uh, in my physics 4A class, we call this pr uh, standard strategy. Uh, you go by four steps. Uh, so let me actually lay out that those four steps. Uh, different classes might kind of label them differently, but I hope you uh, recognize the element of what you learned to do. So in Newton's law problem solving strategy, you do you start by drawing free body diagram. It's um, Free body diagram is a diagram that's part of the problem solving toolkit. It allows you to label all the given information and make sure you didn't miss anything. And it's kind of, it's a diagram where you lay out all the forces. And once you've drawn free body diagram, then you have to define coordinate axis. And when you define coordinate axis, you usually do it so that one of the axis, let's say X, is parallel to the direction of acceleration. And uh, I don't think this will come up for this question, but, but for most 2D problems, you have to decompose the forces. So you have to break down the force vector into what X and Y components. And uh, these steps kind of one leads to the other. Um, so in step two, you have to define the coordinate axis so that you know what the X and Y directions are. Um, and once you've decomposed all the forces into X and Y components, then you should have everything laid out in the free body diagram in a way that allows you to the fourth and the final step, which is writing down the Newton's second law equation. Net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And for 2D prob or 2D or 3D problems, this is actually multiple equations in one. For 2D, it would be net force in the X direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the X direction and net force in the Y direction is mass times acceleration in the Y direction. Um, and if you did the step number two correctly, then uh, this should be zero. Um, now, Here's one reason why reviewing Newton's law problem solving strategy is useful even at the beginning of physics 4B. Because I'll tell you right now, in physics 4B, we are not going to be using standard strategy that often. Because it just, you know, Newton's law problem doesn't come up that often. But what this is useful as is that this is a model of a systematic problem solving. This is the thing that students struggle with the most in physics. Students are so often looking for the equation to use, <laughs> what formula to plug in numbers into. And uh, in all but the easiest uh, physics problems, you don't just don't have that. The hallmark of a physics problem is that there is no single simple formula that you just plug in numbers into. It's, a, that it's an entire system you have to analyze. You have to come up with your own equations that, um, you, uh, you, so that you write down and then you simplify it and then you finally have a formula that you can plug in number into. But working through that, deriving the formula, that is the, the big chunk of physics problem solving. So the Newton's law problem solving strategy is good as an example of how how that's done. And uh, you will see other examples uh, in physics 4B and I hope you kind of draw some similarities um, as we go through those new strategies. So um, let me work through this question here. So I'm gonna, um, I'll guess I'll just go in order. I'll do part A first. So I'm doing it for the top of the circle. 
So I'm kind of taking this picture here. This is the picture I'm looking at. I should start out with a free body diagram. So uh, I, when I draw free body diagram, I try to keep it as simple as possible. I use a dot, uh, sorry, this is the new one note. <laughs> I, I have a circle that I'm gonna say is a dot. <laughs> um, I use a dot to represent the object. So this is the object of mass M. So, and I identify all the forces. And this is the part that should take the most amount of thinking, care, because if you do this wrong, then the rest of the steps are messed up. If you do this right, then the rest kind of follows through mechanically. So when I'm drawing forces, I like to draw only the forces that, I, that are necessary, that I know has to be there. Uh, one force that I know has to be there uh, in this case and almost every case is there has to be gravity. So let me draw gravity as a force, mg. Looking at this uh, picture here, I see that there should be one more force. There's this uh, string that's touching the ball. So it must be pulling on the ball. So there should be a tension force that's uh, pulling the ball down. So there should be a downward uh, tension force. And then I think to myself, should there be another force? And as I'm thinking to myself and thinking out loud, one of the things that I'm looking at is, uh, I should look at and kind of make sure that it makes sense, is that these two forces that you see here combined represents an acceleration that's downward. And I need to be okay with that, that, um, that downward acceleration makes a sense for this snapshot. And depending on how well you did it in physics 4A, it might take a little bit of time, maybe not. And eventually it should make sense that, yes, uh, you should have downward acceleration here this is gonna be your centripetal acceleration. Um, the, the, because this ball is moving in a circle, it is always undergoing centripetal acceleration. Um, so up here, it's, uh, um, you know, centripetal acceleration points to the center here. So when the ball is up there, the centripetal acceleration is pointing downward. When the ball is down here for part B, centripetal acceleration will be upward. So the free body diagram I do, it has to be consistent with this direction of acceleration. And I see that it is, I, I see that it is so I'm fine with that. Okay, uh, let me move on to step number two. I have to define coordinate axis. I found my direction of acceleration. So let me make that my direction of the positive X axis. Um, Okay, I don't need to decompose any forces. Everything is along the positive x direction. Um, so all I need to do is a step number four. I need to write down the Newton's second law equation. The net force, which is uh, tension plus mg. Oh, by the way, uh, tension at top because part B is gonna be different. Uh, that's equal to mass times acceleration. All right, um, so that's the end of what we call standard strategy. And this is a good point to kind of stop, uh, see what you know. So the goal of Newton's law problem solving strategy is to reach this point, which isn't actually the answer because you know it's a general problem solving strategy. The strategy doesn't know what question was asked of you, but the goal of the strategy is to get you to a point where whatever the question is, you are in a place to answer it. And that place to be is to have a system of equations in which you can identify knowns and unknowns and solve for the unknowns. So I have my system of equations, system of one equation, uh, where I hopefully have only one unknown, but let's see, let's count all the knowns and uh, all the things that I don't know. Now, I don't know the tension. That is the question I'm trying to find it. I know the mass, I was given the mass here. I know G, I mean, I wasn't given it, but I remember G should be 
9.8 meters per second square. Um, and the mass I know that already. Hmm. Acceleration, was I given that? Now, as I look at the given information, radius and velocity, I don't see acceleration. And this is where it's helpful if you remember something about centripetal acceleration. Because in physics 4A, you are given a formula for centripetal acceleration. That centripetal acceleration is equal to the tangential speed squared over the radius of the circle that it's moving. So I'm not given the acceleration directly, but I'm, give, uh, I'm being given acceleration in terms of these two quantities which are given. So let me go just to one more step here and just to rewrite this as m times v squared over r. Now I have one equation in terms of one unknown. So I just solve for that one unknown and I'll be home free. Um, tension at the top is equal to, let me move that mg over. So I have uh, mv squared over r minus mg. Um, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a minimum speed of v at which the tension will be zero. And as the ball moves faster and faster, tension has to be greater to, um, so that the, yeah, I think it all that makes sense. Yeah, so that's the answer. And uh, to actually answer the homework question, you do not have to plug in the numbers. When you are plugging in the numbers, this is one thing to be aware of about the uh, my open math questions we use in this class, which is that they are all programmed in with default tolerance of 1%, uh, which means um, you need to keep a minimum of three significant figures to make sure that you don't uh, get rounding errors, which result in the system telling you your answer is wrong when it's kind of right. So, you know, keep three significant figures, then you will get an answer that um, should be graded as correct if it's actually correct. Okay, uh, let me speed it up here and actually finish answering part B. <laughs> At the bottom of the circle, so it's the exact same process with some minor details changed. So I'm sorry, me... I have a question. Yeah. So uh, in the part A, uh, in the free body diagram, um, so you draw for, um, the tension and the mg downward and then the acceleration also downward. So which force will keep the ball not falling down? Um, no force. The ball is accelerating downward. It is accelerating downward. <laughs> there is no upward force here at all. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Let me uh, rephrase the question. I think uh, when people ask what keeps the ball from falling downward, um, this is how I'm trying to parse your question. Uh, and mean, thank you for asking that question because this is uh, kind of the work that um, is done in physics 4A. It's not, um, and it, you know, this is the work that takes a long time to actually, um, to get done because it has to do with uh, realigning your intuition so that what you intuitively expect aligns with the equations that we write down. And here, what you are kind of intuitively seeing and expecting is that um, as you spin the ball, uh, one thing that you see is that the string remains taut. This string that you see here, it remains taut, uh, straight when the ball is at the bottom. And when the ball is at the bottom, that the string remains taut, that seems reasonable. No one's having any issue with that. When the ball is at the top, now if you simply release the ball from there, then the string will go slack. So um, what you are used to seeing is that as you're spinning it, the string remains taut. And at least when I hear people say, ask what keeps the ball from falling down, what you really mean to say <laughs> in a mathematically precise way is what's keeping the string taut. 
And what's uh, keeping the string taut is the fact that tension is greater than zero or that it's a non-zero value. And string can only pull, so this tension can only be in one direction. It can only be downward. So what really keeps the string taut is that this acceleration is greater than G because G is when it's in free fall, that's when the string will start to go slack. That's when this, um, um, and that condition is met when the V is so small that this V squared over R is exactly G. That's when the tension is zero. As long as the speed is greater than that, the centripetal acceleration formula says the acceleration will actually be greater than G. And either in order to make the ball accelerate downward faster than it would under free fall, tension has to be greater than zero. Hopefully that answers the question. If not, <laughs> ask a follow-up question. Um, so, you know, and I think I say this to my physics 4A students that physics 4A is the hardest physics class. It's even harder than physics 4B. And part of that is that a good chunk of the work you are doing or you are supposed to be doing in physics 4A is realigning your intuition, kind of um, uh, refining your intuition so that um, what you are used to expressing in imprecise language, you uh, learn to express in more mathematically precise way. So anyway, so that's part A. Um, part B, um, yeah, let me go through this a little bit more quickly and it's actually also a little bit easier too. Um, and so <laughs> let me go through this a little bit more quickly. The free body diagram looks like this. Um, it has gravity still, uh, mg downward. And uh, there's tension and this time it's upward. And um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, so here, if one were to ask the question, what's can be keeping the ball from falling down? We can honestly say that it's the tension. Now, uh, what's uh, um, important to know here is that tension will actually be greater than mg. So uh, with this particular free body diagram, um, acceleration can actually be zero. And that would be the case if uh, this velocity were zero, then acceleration will be zero, tension will be equal to mg. We don't have that. As we drew here, when the ball is down here, the acceleration should be upward. So here you actually have upward acceleration. So tension has to be greater than mg. So, um, so that's step number one. We, I drew free body diagram. Let me define my coordinate axis. I'm going to define upward as my positive x axis. Um, nothing to decompose. Now I can write down my net force equation. Uh, I like to write down my net force equation in a way all the symbols are positive and the signs are in the equation. So with that convention, my net force would be uh, tension positive minus mg. Um, so that my m and g are positive, but it's opposing tension. Um, that's equal to mass times acceleration. And I learned from doing part A, acceleration is a V squared over R. So it's mv squared over R. So, oh, this is tension at bottom. Um, I can, so this is the end of the standard strategy. I have this uh, system of one equation in terms of one unknown that I'm ready to solve for. So let me solve for that. I get tension at the bottom is equal to moving mg over. I have mv squared over r plus mg. So tension at the bottom is greater. It's at minimum mg. And depending on whatever the velocity is, it's going to be greater. Get questions, comments on this question? If not, let me move on. Um, I need to go a little faster. I had planned about 30 more minutes. I mean, you know, we can go over, but, <laughs> but let, let me go a little bit faster. I did one question and I think that took me 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, I, and I think uh, the rest of the questions I can do a little bit more quickly because um, the standard strategy is the one that actually takes a, a lot of talking and a lot of, um, 
explanation. I mean, you know, if I were being timed and I just want you to do it quickly, I could have done that above question in less than five minutes, but, you know, it would have made very little sense to a lot of people. <laughs> All right, let me do this question here. Um, so I think I pulled this question out because it deals with the energy <laughs> and thermodynamics, a good chunk of it is about energy and conservation of energy, um, at least in the conceptual uh, realm. So he says a small block of some mass, let me give it a symbol, M, start out at rest point A, slides to B, where I'm given its a speed, um, Vb, then slides along the horizontal surface a distance of 10 meters before coming to rest at C. All right, um, it asks, what is the work of friction along the curved surface? Mm. So this is where I hope you start thinking in terms of energy conservation, not in terms of forces, not in terms of kinematics. One thing that should really encourage you to do that is the fact that this is a curved surface. If you try to, one, you're not given enough information to actually do any detailed force analysis. Two, even if you were, um, it will get too complicated. It's uh, much better <laughs> if you can somehow work this out on the basis of conservation of energy. So, um, so that's kind of the starting point. Um, we, uh, with the conservation of energy, it's uh, useful to look at snapshots. So I have this snapshot here at point A. So here, I, I think I actually know the expression for total energy, the total energy at this point, which is going to be a potential energy plus kinetic energy. But I know kinetic energy here should be zero because starting from rest. So my potential energy is just gonna be gravitational potential energy. Oh, let me give this a label, H. So my starting energy at point A is going to be uh, MGH, that's my energy at point A. So, and uh, oh, by doing that, I kind of implicitly set this point to be Y equal to zero. So when I look at the second snapshot here at point B, my gravitational potential energy will be zero, but I'll have kinetic energy. So I'll have kinetic energy uh, that's gonna be equal to uh, one half mvb squared. And now I hope you have enough intuition about energy, uh, enough intuition about mechanical energy from your physics foray here, which is that the moment they mention the friction, you should realize oh, mechanical energy is not gonna be conserved. So the total energy at point A and the total energy at point B, if there were no friction, these two would have been equal. But because there is friction, they won't be equal. Instead, there will be a difference in the total energy. There will be a change in energy, which I might define it as total energy at point B minus total energy at point A. And this change in energy, um, and this is another thing that hopefully you learned at an intuitive level from physics 4A, which is that whenever there's a change in energy for the agent that's causing the change, you are looking for work done. Uh, work is what changes energy. Uh, you know, work can be expressed in two different ways. There's the definition of work, which is the force dot product of displacement. That's one. But the physical meaning of work is that it causes energy to change. So here, all this change in energy, we are blaming all of that on friction. So this is gonna give you the work done by friction. So uh, once you get that, then the rest is kind of just writing out the expressions. So the work done by friction should be 
the total energy at point B, which is one half mvb squared, one half mvb squared. You have all the numbers for that um, mass here. Uh, convert it to kilograms, by the way, um, minus the total energy at point A, uh, mgh. Now, when you plug in all these numbers, you are actually going to get an answer that's uh, negative. And that's perfectly fine. That's in fact what the question here expects you to have, a negative numerical answer. And the physical meaning of that is that the, the work of friction is doing is reducing the mechanical energy, um, it's specifically kinetic energy. So you plug in the uh, numbers, you get a negative answer, plug in the answer here with the minus sign, that should be <laughs> all that's needed. Um, okay, so with that in, uh, so part B is similar to part A, it just uh, takes one additional step. Um, so, sorry, I have a question on part A. Yeah. Um, do we have to calculate the work on friction uh, from B to C? Um, no, because it says along the curve, the surface. So it's just A to B. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. If uh, it's uh, all the way to C, then it'll be too easy because it's, it's basically this entirety is gone due to friction. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but along the curve surface, surface, so it's just A to B. Now, now we do B to C. That's uh, what part B is asking. That's what part B relates to because the part B is asking, it's kind of asking in a sneaky way because it looks like it's asking for the coefficient of kinetic friction. And if you focus on that, start looking up uh, formulas for coefficient of kinetic friction, you're just gonna get lost. Uh, even though it's asking for coefficient of kinetic friction, the place you have to start from is conservation of energy again, or at least the energy considerations again. And starting from that, I'm actually gonna be using this uh, at some point in the steps. And then I'm gonna be finally using the expression for kinetic friction force. Um, but the, the starting place here, uh, the natural good starting place has to be consideration of energy. So um, here, the total energy at point C, uh, that's kind of simple. You have zero speed, zero potential energy, so zero. <laughs> so um, the change in energy as you go from um, B to C, and let me make this easy for myself. I'm just gonna look for absolute value so I don't have to deal with the signs. That's simply gonna be whatever energy you had at point B, which is one half mvb squared. All of that energy is gone into, um, um, or all of that energy is reduced to zero due to the work done by friction force. Now, this is a, a part of the physics problem solving, which is that you try to connect what you know with what you are being asked for. And so I want to relate energy to coefficient of kinetic friction. And if you are looking things up on kinetic coefficient of kinetic friction, the context where it comes up is the kinetic friction force, which is the coefficient times the normal force. So, so I can, if I have a kinetic friction force uh, through knowing the mass of the block and in this horizontal plane thing, this N here should be mg. I mean, N is not always mg, but in this case it is. So once you have a kinetic friction force, you should be able to relate it to a coefficient. So, then now <laughs> my focus moves on to relating the energy to the kinetic friction force. And that's where it's good to remember the definition of work. Work is defined as force times displacement. And as the block moves from here to here, displacement is gonna be 10 meters there. This is my delta X and the Friction force will be doing negative work to uh, cause this amount of uh, magnitude of energy change. So um, let me kind of write down that relationship here. 
this amount of energy change is going to be related to work done by friction force. Again, absolute value so that I don't have to worry about signs. And this work done by friction force, I can use this definition of mechanical work. It's going to be the friction force times the displacement to delta x. And I'm just going to plug in positive values for both of these so that I get what I would get with absolute value. So, okay, let me uh, write out this right hand side in, do, uh, in place of the kinetic friction force. And I think I'm going to be ready to solve for the coefficient. Um, so this is going to be mu k times mg times the displacement. Now, when you look at this uh, system of equations, uh, this is the left hand side equal to this uh, right hand side. You see that you have one equation and one unknown, just the uh, uh, coefficient. So solve for coefficient and you should be done. In fact, um, as you, I think about doing that, M actually cancels out. So I didn't even need to know the mass. I mean, you know, I know it, but I didn't need to. So let me solve for coefficient. The coefficient of kinetic friction is, let me move G and delta X over. It's gonna be VB squared over two G delta X. Plug in the numbers, that should give you the coefficient. Um, if you want, you can kind of do the unit check. The unit on the numerator is a meter squared per second squared. Unit on the denominator, if you work it a lot, it should also be meter squared per second squared. Uh, coefficient of kinetic friction is a unitless quantity, so you should get something unitless. Good. So yeah, uh, it's a kind of practice on um, using energy for problem solving. Uh, you're going to see, you know, energy is going to come up throughout the semester, actually. Because even when we do electricity, electric potential energy becomes an important um, thing to consider. Uh, there's a kind of saying that the conservation of energy and conservation of momentum are the twin pillars of classical mechanics. And almost in any question, kind of thinking in terms of energy and momentum is going to be useful. Um, momentum, not as much this semester, but energy, definitely. Okay, so let me, if there are no questions on this, let me move on to the next. Do I want to do this? Maybe I don't. Uh, I'll do this quickly. I kind of pulled this out as an example of, um, how do I say, as a counter example for the saying attributed to Lord Kelvin, who said, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. <laughs> if you never heard it, well, you heard it here first. <laughs> what it means is um, in many branches of science, there's a kind of, you know, where a lot of the activity is a co collection of facts. And what we physicists pride ourselves over is that in physics is fundamental science, we try to, um, learn things at their very basic level. So we don't memorize a bunch of formulas. We try not to memorize a bunch of facts. Um, so that's the kind of default mindset in physics. I call this a counter example because the best way to do this question is to have memorized a bunch of formulas. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, this is a mass attached to spring it's a simple harmonic oscillator problem so if uh, you know this is what the diagram will look like i have a mass attach it to a spring attach it to a wall and this is spring has some spring constant and this is mass is going to oscillate back and forth and uh, you should have covered this towards the end of last uh, like two three weeks of uh, physics 4a and um, what you should remember from that coverage is that when this thing oscillates, it oscillates at a natural frequency. And the formula for that natural frequency of oscillation, this by the way is omega, Greek letter omega, it's not W. Um, the natural frequency of oscillation is the square root of K over M. I mean, you can drive it by solving the 
uh, equation of motion and <laughs> going through all the differential equation stuff. You can do it, uh, but um, it's the, the kind of the standard way to do this is to have memorized this as a formula. So <laughs> that's kind of what you needed to do. <laughs> and to answer part A here, the easiest thing to have done is to kind of have memorized a bunch of formulas and expressions. Uh, one of them is a kind of equation for the displacement. When you have a simple harmonic oscillator as a function of time, it'll move uh, like uh, so, uh, the amplitude times uh, sine or cosine, either is fine. I guess I'll use sine here, sine of omega t, uh, where the uh, the equilibrium position is x equals zero. So this is x equals zero, and the uh, velocity is gi also given by uh, v max times. Um, well, let me do absolute value of velocity. <laughs> absolute value uh, here. It's going to be cosine of omega t. And um, what you should know, uh, and I guess this is a more physics-like part, which is that the velocity through kinematics, it's related to position by the derivative. So you can actually uh, see how this relates to this coefficient here, Vmax. When I take the derivative of that expression there, I get a times angular velocity also a natural frequency of oscillation times uh, cosine of omega t, which means this is equal to the Vmax that's given there. So you have everything you need to solve for this. Um, solve this for A, that's your answer. So your amplitude is Vmax divided by omega, where omega comes from this formula. Um, and the period, that's another formula you had to memorize, <laughs> having to do with uh, anything that's a periodic. Um, there's a, uh, when you are covering oscillation, uh, there's a kind of a few related quantities that you had to know. Um, one kind of starting point is relationship between period and frequency, uh, period is one over F. And the other is the relationship between frequency and angular frequency. Uh, frequency, or let me rewrite this the other way. Angular frequency is uh, uh, two pi times frequency. And believe it or not, this, or believe it please, this two pi is doing a unit conversion because, well, quote unquote unit conversion, because the frequency is given in terms of cycles per second and angular frequency is given in terms of radians per second. And uh, this radians will be phase angle in this case. But in any case, uh, this two pi is converting from cycles to radians because one cycle, there are two pi radians in one cycle. Anyway, so um, these are the once again, formulas that you kind of just have to have memorized. And once you have that, then you can see that uh, period is, um, so F is omega over two pi. So period should be two pi over omega. I have omega there, oh, I have, yeah, I have K and M. So uh, once I have omega, plug it in here, that'll give me period in seconds because this two pi already did conversion from radians to one nut. And C and D, I'll just to give you the answer. Um, C, it should be zero. Um, I don't know if there's a lesson that's uh, relevant here for uh, physics 4B. I mean, it, you know, it, it's that it, when it's at maximum speed, it's at equilibrium position and equilibrium is defined by having net force equal to zero. If you have a zero net force, you have zero acceleration. And what is the magnitude of acceleration of the mass when the speed is zero? Um, that takes a little more work. I think the easiest one, 
surprisingly, is to um, kind of do a little more calculus. So you have this expression for V of t, and you know from calculus that acceleration is given by the derivative of velocity. So I can just take one more derivative of this. That will give me, uh, using the chain rule, I get minus a omega squared times the sine of omega t. And this coefficient here, that's my a max. That's the acceleration I get when, um, when sine of omega t is one, meaning the, the, the mass is at the maximum displacement. And you can also do it the other way. You know, you, you know the maximum displacement and you can use a Hooke's law and you can do that. That's fine. That will give you the same answer. It just takes more steps. So, so I, um, so I uh, pulled this out as an example of um, sometimes they're just the formulas to memorize. And you will actually see some questions like that for problems at two. I think there's a question about Stefan Boltzmann law. It's a radiation law. There's a formula for that in your textbook. You just have to know it. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, in physics 4C, we are gonna cover black body radiation a little bit more. But um, yeah, there are some there are some aspects of physics where sometimes you just have to have things memorized. <laughs> so any questions on this question? If not, let me move on to the last and the final one. And I'll, um, so, you know, it'll take me more than four minutes to cover what I need to cover. And uh, when I'm done covering this, we'll call end of the session there. Um, so uh, uh, this is another energy question. And I think a part to the especially is one where uh, it'll give you some practice for kind of general problem solving. This is the skill that we are trying to develop in all physics classes, which is that you hear a description of a physical system, you think through it, you come up with a mathematical description of the system, and part of that mathematical description somehow boils down to a system of equations, which then you can solve algebraically to find the answer that you are looking for. And uh, that's what you will be doing in D. And that's a kind of, um, you know, the, the question like these will, where if someone asks me, oh, what formula do I plug in numbers into? My answer is, there is no one formula. <laughs> you just have to go through the steps to actually find the formula yourself. So, so let me uh, start this here. Um, it says an object of uh, mass M is released at point A, uh, so it's starting out at V equal to zero, slides to the bottom, so at the bottom here, it's moving at some speed, uh, collides with a horizontal massless spring, compressing the maximum distance of 0 0.75 meters. So let me imagine this is where the maximum point of compression is, the distance was 0 0.7 or, uh, Give it a maximum distance it compressed was D. Um, and this is M here at that point. Now, the thing about the maximum compression is that, that, that at that point, speed is equal to zero. Because if it's not, then it will either be compressing more or it will be on the way out. So at the maximum compression, speed is zero. That will help us when we figure out the energy, uh, uh, energy terms. The spring constant is uh, given, and the height of the incline is some height. And the horizontal surface is, less, is frictionless. Oh, um, so there must be some friction here. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, uh, there's a principle, you know, it's, it's kind of pointing out one thing is to, uh, at the same time, excluding the other things. If they are saying the horizontal surface is frictionless, that must mean the non-horizontal surface is probably not frictionless. So I'm gonna assume that this incline has friction. So, oh yeah, so when it asks, what is the speed of the object at the bottom of the incline? So one thing I'm not going to be using is energy conservation from point A to, uh, let me label my points. 
Uh, one thing I'm not going to be using is energy conservation from point A to B because from this hint here, I have a sense there's friction here. So I think I know energy won't be conserved on the way down. So I won't use energy conservation along that step. Um, what I think I can rely on is everything happening here conserves energy because conserves mechanical energy. It's a frictionless incline and there's nothing else. There's no kind of completely inelastic collision. I don't see anything here that would dissipate mechanical energy. So I'm going to use conservation of energy within this box. So I'm at state B, going to state C here, energy is going to be conserved. So I can say total energy at point B is equal to total energy at point C. This is, by the way, the kind of the starting point for applying any conservation law problem solving strategy. You identify the conserved quantity and you start out with the equation that uh, asserts the fact that this conserved quantity is conserved. Um, so that's my kind of symbolic statement for that. Now I have to write out all the terms. The energy at point B, it's just going to be the kinetic energy, one half mvb squared, and nothing else, is equal to, at point C, there's going to be a spring uh, potential energy. So spring potential energy, I kind of remember the formula from, um, from physics 4A, it's one half spring constant times whatever displacement is squared. At point C, it's at this maximum, dis, uh, maximum displacement D. So it's going to be one half K times D squared. And normally there would be kinetic energy, but I already worked out that kinetic energy at that point would be zero. So this is my conservation of energy equation. Conservation of energy equation. Um, it looks like I have only one unknown and everything else is known. Mass is known, spring constant is known, D is known. Yeah, so I can just solve this for, um, sorry, I'm trying to pick a color. Uh, solve this for the speed here and I can, I ha I can just plug in the numbers. Vb is equal to, I, uh, I'm going to go fast just to do this in my head. Cancel out the one halves move and take the square root, then it's going to be d times the square root of k over m. So that'll give me the speed and that'll be it. Uh, by the way, once you have a, you also have c because the c is describing, okay, the spring pushes the thing back and sends the object back towards the incline. So I guess that would be like the b prime uh, where it's now about to move up the incline. And the, in, within this entire box, energy is conserved. So the, when the bar M comes back to this point, it should uh, come back to the same kinetic energy it had before, which means the speed here should be the same speed of Vb that you calculated earlier. It, the velocity is different. It's in the opposite direction, but speed is the same. Good. So let's do B and D. B is a little bit easier because um, it, we just have to work through the energy differences. And having done A, I think I know all the energy terms. D is going to take a little bit more work. So let me do B first. Um, so I'm back to the thing I was dealing with in a different problem earlier that I have the, so at this position here, I have total energy at point A, uh, which just gonna be MGH, gravitational potential energy. And at this point here, I have total energy at point B, which by the way, happens to be equal total energy at point C. And I think I might just use that instead. <laughs> and from A to B, there's gonna be change in energy. And this change in energy, I can blame that on the work of due to friction. So let me write that out here. 
change in energy going from A to B is going to be the total energy at point B minus total energy at point A. And because the total energy at point B is equal to total energy at point C, I'm just going to use total energy at point C, one half KD squared. I mean, I could use this, but I prefer to use this because it, this is in terms of all the known quantities. So in some sense, it's a simpler. Uh, if I somehow made a mistake in working out VB, this is not affected. So anyways, <laughs> it's more of a personal preference than requirement. Minus the gravitational potential energy, MGH. Um, and that's going to be, I'm going to blame all of this uh, on the work done by friction as this thing slides. So I'm going to say that's work done by friction. And I think I have everything to just plug in numbers too. And here, uh, as we do before, if you plug in numbers, you will find that the work done by friction is less than zero. That's fine. That's totally expected. It's because the friction force is reducing mechanical energy here. So you should find the negative answer. That's what you should plug in here to get your answer. Um, now, part D is where um, you have to think through, kind of develop your own equations and mathematical descriptions and kind of set up your own new system of equations and solve it. Uh, I can tell you what the answer will not be. The answer will not be this uh, original starting height. It's because you have friction and the friction does negative work while this is sliding down. And it also does negative work while it's sliding up. That's the thing that makes friction not conservative because while this is sliding down, the friction force is opposing that motion doing negative work. And on the way up, oops, um, on the way up while this is sliding up, friction um, uh, actually points downward doing negative work again. So, um, so whatever height the block reaches, it'll be something a little bit less than two meters. So that has to be our starting point. And um, now we just have to <laughs> figure out. So, <laughs> What would be nice to have here is um, knowing that friction force is what we blame for mechanical energy not being conserved. Uh, it would be nice as just knowing what the magnitude of the friction force is because that'll give me some handle on calculating how much change in energy there is to um, account for that on the slide back up. So, um, what I see here is what I worked out in part B can be used to figure out the magnitude of a friction force. And, and the reason uh, figuring that out is useful is that magnitude of friction force, kinetic friction force, is given by the coefficient times the normal force. And the coefficient is going to be the same at both directions. And the normal force will also be the same both directions. It's a, a normal force, you know, that's the component that opposes the, this component of gravity. So, um, so if I figure out the magnitude of friction force on the slide down, that's going to be the same magnitude on the slide up. So I can write down some kind of expression for, for this much distance traveled, this much energy is lost. So. So let me uh, figure out the magnitude of friction force. And what I can use there is this here, work of friction on the object, which I figured out some answer to. And I can relate that to the friction force using definition of work, which is, um, you know, force dot product with the displacement. And, you know, if we do that, it's going to be all negative numbers all there. So, so let's deal with the absolute value <laughs> that's going to be equal to the magnitude of friction force times the displacement. And you have to be care a little bit careful with the displacement here. 
it's going to be the displacement along the incline. So um, that's worth, I mean, I guess this is one of those special right triangle. So, I mean, if you just want the numerical value, that should be 4.0 meters. Um, or if you want the actual correct expression in terms of H and the angle, um, that's the hypotenuse. So let me label that L. Um, so L over H is equal to sine of theta. It's getting too late. H over L is equal to sine of theta. So if you solve for L, that's going to be, so or this delta X is going to be H divided by sine of theta. Um, here, sine of theta happens to be one half, H is two, so L is four. So, so all of this, I think, gives us enough information to write down an expression for the magnitude of friction force. So magnitude of friction force is equal to whatever that work was, which I figured out the answer to, divided by the length of the hypotenuse, which would be H divided by sine theta. So that's the magnitude of friction force. And using that, I can now kind of think through this process. Let me uh, clear up some space here so that I can write out what that process is. So when I do problem solving, especially new problems, problems I haven't seen before, something new, I'm kind of deriving entirely new formulas. What I like to do is to think sequentially, kind of visualize what's, what's happening in real time. So this is moving up with some V, B. And as it's moving up, it's slowing down. It's slowing down actually for two reasons. It's slowing down due to gravity and it's slowing down due to, uh, due to the friction force. Um, gravity, will, gravity will conserve energy. So to some degree, I don't have to worry about it too much. Um, uh, well, yeah. Uh, friction won't conserve energy. So I have to take extra care to account for the work done by friction. Now, as this is sliding up, it slows down, slows down, eventually comes to a stop somewhere at a point lower than height of two meters. So uh, let me call that a point, I don't know. Let me call that point X final. So this is gonna be one of my parameters for describing this physical situation. So I'm gonna use energy conservation still at this point here. I'm going to have total energy at point B, uh, which is you know this energy here that hasn't changed on the way up. That's the energy I'm starting with, and this is the final stopping point. This is going to be a new point. Let me label it D, and there will be some total energy at point D. So I need to uh, write out that expression. So as you go from uh, B prime. As you go from B prime to D, the energy is gonna change. And this change in energy, as you go from B prime to D, is going to be the energy at point D minus the energy down here, which is energy at point B, same as energy at point B prime. And this change in energy will come from work done by friction. So, um, and that's gonna be the, so I know it's gonna be negative work. So let me put that into the, put the sign into the equation, that negative sign um, minus times the friction force. Um, magnitude of, just to make sure there's no confusion about if it's friction force is positive or negative. I'm just gonna use the positive value times the displacement, which will be X final here. So this is kind of my starting point for my system of equation. And it's gonna be system of one equation. Um, the unknown I want to solve for is X final. And I figured out the friction force, so that is presumed to be known. 
So what I need to do is write out the um, expressions for the total energy at point D and point B prime. And let's see what we have to solve, what we have uh, to work with from there. Okay, uh, let me just work through this here. The energy at point B or energy at point D is just gonna be the gravitational potential energy. I need to work out this. Um, so that's the opposite side with the hypotenuse given by XF. So this height here, lowercase h, is gonna be uh, hypotenuse times the sine of the angle, 30 degrees or eta. So what I have to do is write down the expression. So that's the height, uh, that's the height at the uh, point, uh, point D, uh, gravitational potential energy is gonna be MGH. So that's gonna be mg times that height, x final times sine of theta minus total energy at point B. I'm going to use this expression here because that's the one that has most uh, known quantities. Kd squared is equal to minus times the um, magnitude of friction force times the x final. So, I have two x finals here. So I need to uh, finish the math and solve for the final x position here. So let me quickly do that. I collect the like terms, collecting the like terms. Uh, let me collect the terms with x final on the left hand side. Then I get mg sine theta plus the magnitude of friction force, and I kind of factored out x final already, is equal to, moving this over to the right hand side, one half kd squared. So solve for x final, di uh, divided by the coefficient there, I get x final is equal to one half kd squared over mg sine theta plus the magnitude of the friction force. So, okay, this is something I can plug in all the known numbers to get x final. Now, one word of caution, that's not what the question asks for. <laughs> question is asking for the vertical distance. So I have to remember that this hypotenuse is the vertical distance h divided by sine theta. So once I have x final, I have to remember to multiply both sides by sine theta to solve for h here. So it's a multi-step process. It takes time, it takes thinking through, and um, when you get it, you'll like it. <laughs> um, but this is kind of, well, this is a very typical of a physics question. And this is the part that a lot of people do find challenging. But once you gain enough practice at it and you are good at it, that will be what you enjoy about physics. Because it's like any difficult thing that takes people a lot of time to learn. It's, it's something you know that, uh, that it's something that you are able to do that not everyone else can. So.